Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I'm immigration lawyer John Kasravi. Uh, apparently, I've been live maybe earlier. I'm not sure what's going on with the timeline <laughs> that it's showing on my, my side. But we're here to do our regular Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific. We just went from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. to discuss uh, U.S. immigration laws and all the questions and issues that are involved with that in general educational format. So you're better, you have better understanding what's going on because this stuff changes a lot. Today's a special episode. I'm on semi vacation. Uh, and so, uh, you could, uh, imagine I, my background is a little different than what it's used to. I'm in Carlsbad, California at Legoland. And so that's a Lego image right behind me. I hope it's not too distracting as we get into all this kind of stuff, because a lot of changes are happening all across the world with regard to immigration. I'm sure the question is going to come to go all over this kind of stuff. Uh, but having said that, let's get it started. All right, everybody. So we have the questions popping in uh, on TikTok. Uh, I'm my screen name is Immigration Lawyer uh, John. Uh, I am available there. Uh, it shows that it's live, Immigration Lawyer John. Uh, but we'll, I'll take your questions there if I catch it there. In the meantime, you have some questions coming in on Facebook and on YouTube. And keep in mind, we have uh, two different YouTube channels. One's a regular JQK Law YouTube channel, which is more longer formats, and then we have a JQK Clips, which has hundreds and hundreds of little one to three or four minute clips of information just gets down to what your questions are. You can find a lot of information, almost like an encyclopedia of information right there. So uh, be, you know, get into that if, if that's something uh, you want to find information on. It's definitely there. Uh, but having said that, let's get the question started. Uh, my, my wonderful assistant Katrina is online to help me choose. So Marlon, a regular, says, Jake, you have an interview next week, Thursday the 9th. Well, congratulations. Uh, I'm glad that's finally happened. I know you've been waiting a while, and a lot of people are people are messaging you already about timelines. Uh, but the reality is, there's so much delays happening in a lot of different kinds of cases. But it's good to see some things are moving forward. Marlon, thank you so much, and congratulations. Hopefully, hope we get some good news next week. Uh, Myra asks, "How long will it take after being documentarily qualified for an interview in Pakistan?" Uh, well, there's no answer to that, but let me explain what that means for the other viewers. Documentary qualified means the case, an immigrant visa case, a green card case, that's going through the embassy process, also known as consular processing. Uh, they initially have to submit a lot of documents to a group called the National Visa Center. And the National Visa Center reviews them, or called the NVC for short, reviews them to see if things are okay or not, if there's anything major missing, before forwarding the application file to the U.S. Embassy in the, in the home country or the for, foreign country. Now, uh, there's a lot of delays because of the pandemic. And so uh, documented qualified is when the National Visa Center, the NBC, um, says that, uh, you know, we have enough information to move the case forward. And then the embassy is supposed to contact or through the embassy contact you to say there's a interview time here. But how long will that take? There is no fixed time. It's whenever the embassy is ready. And right now we're just seeing massive delays, unfortunately. So the only thing I could say is, Myra, uh, you have to be patient and, and hopefully happen sooner. But there's not much power or control we have over that. The next question is from enclosed. How long does it does uh, how long to get a response after I send a medical RFP I sent a month ago? There's no fixed time on how long it'll take. Recently, I've been getting a lot of RFPs for the medical. Uh, this is in regards to employment-based cases who filed for adjustment status, and they're getting their approvals like you know a week or two afterward. But there's no fixed time, and it really depends on uh, you know the. And the uh, USAS officer handles it and what issues are involved with your case. So I, I, that that's a that's as much I can say. You just have to be patient. Hopefully it doesn't go longer. Uh, Muhammad asks, can a lawyer send a letter to my interviewing officer and ask about the interview decision? Will they respond? Well, a lawyer could do it. You could do it. They can respond if they want to. It's all up to them. So you can have a lawyer do it, but it doesn't mean it's going to make any difference. So I'm going to take a quick break from answering these uh, YouTube and Facebook questions, kind of jump in. We got a couple of questions on TikTok I want to get to as well. Uh, just, just Jesus says, or Jesus Lobo says, hello, greetings from Wisconsin. My friend gave himself up to Border Patrol, applied for asylum. Uh, best of luck. Hopefully that works out for them. Hi, Ed. Hello, sir. My husband's stuck in Afghanistan. Don't know what I needed to. You know, I don't focus on the Afghani cases in particular unless they're already here. They may need to file for, uh, you know, humanitarian parole, or maybe they could go to a third country and do consular processing there. It's a, it's a long situation. Sata asks, how long does the IA-24 take to be done? It depends on how long USCIS wants to take. It could take a long, long time. 
uh, D pass I 45 decision pending since January 2019. So they had an adjustment of status case and it's been pending for since January 2019. I need to know more information about that case. I'm going to be able to answer that. There's a lot more details I need to know. Ahmad asks, is it okay to apply for citizenship or I shall wait of the pandemic? The pandemic has nothing to do with citizenship. So um, you should do it if it's appropriate. Uh, Celeste asks, how do we send questions? I need immigration help. Well, we just sent your question. Uh, Snack says, hi, my extension letter for green card expired, but I still not received a decision. Well, that happens. Celeste, you just got to wait or had any more information about your case, but these delays kind of happen. Celeste, follows up, how do I help my husband to come to U.S. after COVID got him stuck in U.S. when he was here longer? I don't know. I have to have a private consultation to see what's happening. I'm going to answer two more questions on TikTok and then go back to the other social media. Alice asks, what if my status expires, but I have a pending lawsuit? That's unrelated to your immigration status. Talk with a lawyer private. And Horam asks, do we need a passport number for I-130 for siblings application? Well, the form I-130 does ask for the um, the number, um, the, the the passport information of the beneficiary. However, it's not that important. It's not there. It's not, they're not going to like deny the case or something like that. But thank you for your question on TikTok. We'll go back in a sec. But for now, we're going to take some more questions on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, the next one is Sejal asks, hello. The I-45J and the, and the medical, or if you receive, is it a good sign for approval? I-45, which is filed out October 2020, and is, and is a PD, priority day is current. Um, it's a good sign. I mean, you're doing what you need to do, the I-45J, the medical. Um, it, it's not about signs, really. It's just you got to do what you got to do. And if there's no issues, then it's going to be approved. How long is it going to take? I don't know, but I don't really, I can't say something's a good sign or a bad sign. You just got to do what you got to do. It's not something that's answerable in that way. But thank you for your question. Elizabeth asks, I got a notice on my phone yesterday saying USCIS sent my car in the mail. So am I saying if I will get the same social security number, this, the same time with the work permit, uh, send my card. So you're saying send my card. What do you mean? The green card or the EAD? I'm not sure which one you mean. Um, the social security office issues a social security number and card, uh, the work permit separate. So they could come at the same time coincidentally, or they'll be different, but they're two different agencies. The social security office is separately sending it. They're not being consistent. And the work permits, the work permit for USCIS. When USCIS notifies you, they're only going to talk about their own documents that they issue by their own agency. But thank you for your question. Elvis asks, uh, I-601, a waiver timeline is increasing from six months to almost three years. Now, what are your thoughts? Uh, mine was submitted 17 months ago. I mean, the same as everything. Unfortunately, everything's been delayed. Uh, that's it. I, I don't, it's not really about me having thoughts on it. It's just the reality of the situation. Now, 61A waiver is if you enter the U.S. without permission or you overstay too long, resulting in what, what would become a three or 10 year bar. It's a forgiveness for that before you do your embassy interview for consular processing. Uh, unfortunately, these are the delays we're dealing with all around the immigration system. So uh, that, that's, that's all I got. But thank you for your question. Jeremy, a friend asked, uh, when someone calls in with an I-485 question, what question do you ask to flesh out the facts? Maybe wrong form. It is, <laughs> but it's okay, Jeremy. This is, because uh, I, I run different programs for lawyers and for um, regular people, but it's a good question to ask because a lot of people do call me and, and they don't understand. So for adjustment of status, I mean, first of all, you got to find out if the person is actually in the United States or overseas because you only filed the form I-485 adjustment of status if you're actually here in the United States. Uh, so that's the first thing. And secondly, um, you asked if they enter with permission or not, because one of the basics to adjust that is, is that you have to have lawful entry admission or parole. There's some exceptions that are separate from that, but basically you want to first find out if they've passed the first prong of the adjustment of status uh, situation, which is if they enter with admission or parole. Once that's done, the second step is to see what is the basis of the adjustment of status, the family-based or employment-based diversity visa lottery, asylum there's all these different kind of things it could be most of the time it will be family based or employment based and so then you get into questions of you know who's the family member uh, and if it's something they could adjust that is so we have people for example who contact uh who are brothers or like a brother of a u.s citizen they're here in the usa on a tourist visa and they want to file for adjustment status well that's not going to be possible because the brother or sister timeline takes 15 years there's no way they could lawfully stay in the united states for 14 15 years on a tourist visa uh, for them to be able to file for adjustment status. So it gets kind of deeper, but the first things you want to see is if they enter lawfully, because that denotes whether they need a waiver or not, and then also get into whether they violated their status or have criminal history. So it's a three-prong 
Okay, so or four prong maybe. Uh, did you enter lawfully? What is the basis of your adjustment of status case? Have there been criminal history? Have there been immigration violations? And that will really give you the, the main ingredients you need. There's a lot more details that immigration lawyer needs, but in a phone call, you could probably get those within a minute or two if the client's efficient and, and take it from there. But thank you for your question, Jeremy. Uh, Fatiz asks, I filed my case and I already created an account with USCIS. So which kind of documents do they need? Totally, that's a, it depends on your case. It could be a million and one different documents. So it's not something I can answer here, but thank you for your question. So just follows up. Medical RFP submitted August 19th, but still no update online status. Status stuck on fingerprints. So unfortunately, the online system, USCIS.gov, has to update you on cases. It only gets updated, I would say, about 70 to maybe 75% of the time. So if they don't update, it doesn't necessarily mean they haven't received it. When you do submit something to USCIS, you should submit it uh, with tracking so the mail gets tracked. And preferably, they uh, sign the thing itself they, 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 when they receive it. And that way, uh, they could also, um, you could have confirmation that they got it. So if they claim you didn't send it, that way you could have that proof. Um, so hopefully it gets updated, but that does happen. One thing I want to note separately from this, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the show that we have a free consultation giveaways, 15 minute video consultation. So all you got to do is like, subscribe, and leave a comment like consultation or something like that. And my wonderful associate, uh, Katrina, uh, will, will name a person to me separately and I'll announce who the winner is. Usually we do three of them. Um, every 10 minutes or about the 10 minute mark. And I just remembered about that. So Christina, if anyone does mark it, let me know. And we'll set up the free video consultation on TikTok. Um, the, I'll take some TikTok questions so we catch up a little bit. Um, a Jesus blog asks, how long for people applying for asylum to be set free? There's no timeline on that. Uh, Yatin asks, what is the processing time for an I-130 spouse? It varies. If you're a U.S. citizen filing for a spouse, usually eight or 10 months. If you're a green car holder filing for a spouse I-130, it could take, you know, three months to two years. Uh, Horam says, thank you. You're welcome. That team submitted January 2020. Still no answer. You probably are an LPR. That's probably why. I says, what I meant was, can I stay in the United States until a lawsuit is settled? The lawsuit is completely, if you have a lawsuit, it's completely separate from immigration status. You need to request special requests from the immigration department, USCIS, to be able to stay. So the lawsuit's not directly related. Uh, Tharik asked, the NBC asked me to submit a document again. How much Time is it going to take to review? That depends on the person reviewing it. Well, Fossa asks, hello, sir, I'm, Californ I'm, I'm Californian. Uh, I applied for AMP 100 10 months ago and haven't received my interview. Yeah, you got to be patient. That's not an irregular timeline. Uh, Alice, Alison says, hi, what can I do if my I-130 is still not approved by the prior date is current? I don't know. It depends on your case. You may follow adjustment status, but I have to see your case. Uh, user 808, affirmative asylum pending. Can you use advanced parole for travel abroad? Is it safe or not? It's up to you if you want to take that risk. I don't know anything about your case to say if something's safe or not, so you should schedule a consultation with the attorney in private. Tharik says, NBC asked me already answered that. Um, Tharik says, okay, keep asking the same question over again, over again. Okay, so we're at Yatin1001 says, uh, they are an LPR, and that's the situation. LPR, these kind of cases take a while. Um, so, unfortunately, um, you're going to have to be patient, and hopefully we'll get the I-130 approved soon. So let's go back to our questions on uh the, on the regular format so Rao asks i have applied for a green card and work permit on the same time but due to low income i487 i'm not sure i487 i need a co-sponsor i64 you mean um i need a co-sponsor my question is my work permit will it come or will it be on hold until i find a co-sponsor probably it'll be on hold until a co-sponsor is found um that's what usually happens but not 100 percent. so they do whatever they want you know all right next came from TikTok and as well in and is detained, applied for asylum. What is the estimate of time to be set free? There is no estimate of time to be set free. It depends on the case and how they feel about it and a lot of different factors. They should probably hire an attorney to help them for the next steps, but there's no timeline on that stuff necessarily. Uh, Mustafa asked, oh, I answered this question. Yeah, 10 months ago, U U.S. citizenship cases are getting faster in California, but it can easily take a, over a year. Elizabeth asks, good evening. Do you get your work permit and social security number at the same time? Not necessarily. Uh, because, you know, the different agencies handle these things differently. So it's going to be different. So, I mean, let's just talk about that. When historically, I mean, the last couple of years, they changed the work permit form, I-765, so that you could also request your social security number when you're applying in the United States to get it. 
Uh, and what would happen before pandemic was that once the work permit is approved, you get the work permit, the EAD, along with advanced parole, if you submit it for that in the mail. And pretty much at the same time, the Social Security office would send you a Social Security number and a card and you get it. The pandemic hit a huge delays happen, particularly for the Social Security office. So that's getting delayed. But just recently, about a month ago, U.S. guys updated Form I-485, the Adjustment of Status application. So if you are applying for a, a green card uh, and are using Form I-485, you want to request a Social Security card from there or, or number if you, a card or number if you don't have it on the Form I-485. But how long it takes really depends on your local Social Security office. Some of them closed down pretty heavily because of the pandemic and are much slower uh, to respond to anything like here in Southern California. And others have been faster and more responsive. What I've seen in Florida, for example, it has directly to do with the pandemic and be able to staff the organization. So uh, there's there's just these kind of delays that we have to deal with. And, and, and that's just what we're seeing. So you kind of be patient. If you get the work permit and, you know, a month goes by uh, and no response from the Social Security office or no letter, you should try calling them or maybe try to visit the local uh, Social Security office to see what's going on. Maybe take proof of the work permit and that way um, be able to get the card and, and push it through. But it's just there are a lot of different agencies at play here working together. So it makes it really difficult. Uh, Iman asks, is it possible for a B2 visa holder to adjust status using EB3? Thanks. It may be possible if the case is current, but there's issues with immigrant intent. If it looks like you came with a tourist visa to apply and the timing of the process becomes really hard because within a tourist visa, you usually have six months and EB3 case, if you start from the beginning, takes much longer than six months, could take years. So there's just too many factors to happen. We should really contact, and if you have an EB3 case, you probably have a lawyer, your employer does, talk with them about these kind of options, but really get your own attorneys always best and consult with them in private to see what's going on. You don't want to enter with a tourist visa with the intent to adjust status. That could be considered immigration fraud and be problematic for you. Imad asks a regular, uh, I want to take this opportunity and thank you for the great videos and answer. Imad, thank you so much. That was so kind of you. I think you left a very nice review as well. God bless you. I appreciate the kind words. Thiago asks, how about the documentary qualified cases? Is there any way to find out where the case is on the backlog and how many cases embassy is actually processing? Not really. Uh, they're not that transparent to be able to give us that kind of information uh, at the embassy system. So all you can do is really wait. You could try following a lawsuit potentially. Um, that, that option works well many times. Uh, Congress and congressional help, all this kind of stuff, request and expedites if it's urgent enough. Um, but for most people, there's nothing you can do other than just sit and wait. If you have the money, maybe file a lawsuit. Just talk about and about that. Alop asks, "What is the new rule for family petition interview for LPR? My wife is waiting for interviews a long time. There's not necessarily any new rule. Um, just gotta wait. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by new rule. I know, I'm not sure what you've heard." Uh, Elizabeth Darby says, "Thank you for answering my question. God bless you, Elizabeth. Thank you for watching. I wish you the best in the immigration case." Alessandro asks, I filed my I-130 for my wife, and they told me between two to seven months under permanent residence. They, we thought it was going to go faster, but no. I mean, I've seen I-130s uh, petitions from based on LPRs go three months, six months, nine months, but I've easily seen them go 18 months, 20 months as well. Um, I'm not surprised if it's that long. Uh, fortunately, there's just huge delays happening with all this kind of stuff. I do want to mention uh, the winner of our raffle for our free consultation. Uh, for the live viewers, it's Alessan who just asked the question as well. Alessan, take a screenshot of where you're watching this so I can see your username being logged in so I know it's you. And email me at info at jqklaw.com. And I'll reply with some uh, with some response uh, of how to schedule a consultation. For those just tuning in, if you're watching uh, on any of the social media channels, we're giving out free video consultations. We probably got one or two more. What you got to do is like, subscribe, and leave a comment, like say consultation. And my assistant, uh, Katrina, will, uh, you know, name a person about, you know, five or seven minutes from now. And we'll have a free video conference. We'll set it up so we can talk about it. But we have a lot of people who tune in uh, who will have marriage green card cases, fiance cases. They either, either have or they're thinking about doing. So I want to let you know, I have the ultimate marriage green card guide. It's the best place you can go to find information, uh, the basics about the marriage green card process. Just go to marriageimmigrationlaw.com. That's marriageimmigrationlaw.com and download the Ultimate Marriage Green Card uh, ebook and guide. I think you'll be blown away of how much information is there. And if you already started your case, you'll learn from stuff from there 
it's going to be a big help, and I wanted to be out there to the public so they can take advantage of it. Uh, we have another question uh, from Saad. Saad asks, sir, do you know how I can expedite my I-130 petition? Can I bring my spouse to the U.S. with an emergency visa by showing a doctor's note and my father's death certificate? You can always try to expedite things for humanitarian reasons. Uh, I had a one case recently where the, the petitioner, U.S. petitioner, was diagnosed with cancer. We had to fight U.S. guys back and forth for probably uh, like two months, but they expedited the I-130. We got the I-130 completed in three months. Now we're doing consular processing to bring that spouse to the United States. And we're, again, requesting expedites there. Um, but uh, there's different routes to do this. They get a, a different emergency reasons to come. Um, they're all very difficult to get. There's a lot of uh, back and forth with USCIS. Most of them will get denied right now. Uh, but um, you could always give it a shot. Uh, you know, your father's death certificate, I'm not sure that directly shows an expert need unless you have and what the, the doctor's note says. It depends on what the facts are and which officer is reviewing it, if they're open to it or not. So there's a lot of different factors that go into play here. But, uh, you know, try. I mean, at the end of the day, if you want your spouse to be here, you always got to give it a shot. You just got to be careful what you're saying in those letters because anything you tell the government goes on the official record. So you don't want to say something that, you know, is going to hurt you later. And that's where having a lawyer comes in pretty handy to just kind of spot stuff if possible uh, to be consistent in what you're saying. So it doesn't sound like you be inconsistent, which we look to as, you know, you're trying to fabricate something or be disingenuous with the immigration department. But thank you for your question, Sada. I wish the best. I'm sorry uh, about your father's passing. Uh, Yatin asks, uh, they changed my service center. Is that a good thing or no? I get this question every day. Uh, it's not something for you to think about, yet, good or no. Uh, the idea is that USCI sometimes sees that one service center, they have multiple service centers that process cases behind the scenes. And if one is too busy, they try to send it to another location so they can kind of get help or have less busy people doing more work. That's the idea is to make it go faster. Does it actually go faster? No, not necessarily. Does the service center your case is transferred to make a difference in reality? No. It always depends on the individual how they get your case and is working on it and the facts of your case. So there's two different factors there. And so you could have, I have people contact me all day right now saying, oh, my case at Texas Service Center. I'm so worried. How do I move it? Well, you have no power to move it. It's up to them. But just because it's at the Texas Service Center doesn't mean it's going to go faster or slower. It's just something that happens. So what you got to do is just be patient and uh, just hopefully it goes well and be prepared for the next step. So you jump on that, whatever that is. I would thank you for your question. Saad follows up. Thank you for answering your questions. You're welcome. I wish you uh, the best. And God bless you, Saad. I appreciate it. Kiara Terra can, I think that's what it says. Can I do volunteer work while I'm waiting for my work authorization to come through? This is a question I get asked a lot because the definition of what employment is and what unauthorized employment is has been very vague and is interpreted and adjudicated differently depending on which agency you're dealing with and depending on which officer you're dealing with. So what it work for immigration purposes in the United States so that you won't fall afoul of what is unlawful work? I take the most conservative view is that if you're doing something, an activity that an American could do while in the U.S., then that's work and that's a violation. You may be doing volunteer work. Like, for example, I go volunteer at a restaurant or something like that, but that restaurant could have hired an American to do that job. So you technically are working um, you're just not directly being paid at that time. Maybe there's a scheme that says later on when you get a work permit, we'll pay you double to make up for the volunteer work. Again. This kind of stuff happens. So I, I don't recommend people work with authorization and even do volunteer work. Um, now, for sure, will that be a problem? I can't say that, but it's going to depend on the officer that you're dealing with. And the last thing you want to do while you're already waiting for work authorization, you know, you know it's coming, is to do a violation that can mess everything up. So I recommend people don't do anything that can be construed as work if they don't have a work visa or work status or work permit, whatever it is, when they're in the United States to avoid that trouble. Some lawyers could be less lenient. That's just my interpretation and my conservativeness to protect my clients. Um, but different people do it differently. Um, as you want to take on what the exact details of that work are, just by saying volunteer work doesn't give me enough information. For example, if you go and do volunteer work at a soup kitchen to help the homeless on Thanksgiving, I wouldn't be too worried about that. But if you're going to do volunteer work, for Google um, and or just some computer company or something, you know, I, I would have doubts. So um, it just depends on a lot of factors. You should really consult an immigration attorney if you want to have a more more specific consultation uh, and information. Now, I do want to announce the winner of our second uh, pre-consultation raffle, Saad Hashmi, who had asked about the expedites. 
just say, take a screenshot of where you're watching this, email it to me so I know that it's you, and we'll set up a quick 15-minute consultation to talk about what happened with your case to see if anything's possible. But thank you for watching. And for those watching the live show, just uh, and they're just tuning in, like, subscribe, and leave a comments and consultation. And my office gives out free video consultations during our live show. We have one more opening left. We're, we're going to announce that in like five or six minutes from now. Um, just say like, subscribe, and say consultation. And my lovely assistant, Katrina, will name someone in about five or seven minutes, and we'll talk about it there. And also, if you're interested in information about a fiancé visa, a marriage green card, or even started the process, the best place to go to get the initial strategy and understanding of what's going on is downloading the Ultimate Marriage Green Card ebook or guide at marriageimmigrationlaw.com. That's marriageimmigrationlaw.com. We'll take the next question. Bobby asks, I'm a U.S. citizen. I just sent my I-130 and I-138 for my wife to USCIS. How long would it take for my wife to come? Well, there's no direct answer to that. Uh, first, your I-130 has to get approved, taking on average six to 10 months. Once that's approved, you have to deal with the National Visa Center. That could take two or three months or four months on average. But then the next question is, when will the embassy schedule interview time? Some embassies will be fast. And some embassies won't be. So uh, there's no answer there. It depends on the embassy. And in about you know 12 months from now, what in the world is going on in that country? What's going on with the pandemic? And all these different variables that we have no ability to answer. So if this was pre-pandemic and when things are normal and your your wife isn't from Yemen or from you know some country that has you know issues going on that closes down the embassy, let's say they're from Germany or Japan, probably after starting the case and if you did it cleanly and no RFEs and stuff, about a year, maybe a year and a couple months, it would be done. They'd be here as long as your case is done cleanly and your wife doesn't have any particular backgrounds and you're not in a country that has any particular issues with the embassy. But in the world of post-pandemic, when there's shutdowns and all sorts of issues like that, understaffing and all that kind of stuff, there's no real answer to how soon your wife's going to come. Hopefully, it won't be more than a year and a half. But if it was, I wouldn't be surprised. And I would tell you that in a consultation, be prepared. There are no answers about timelines. We can only hope for the best. But everything is very slow right now. And uh, the system's kind of stuck. And it's, uh, you know, there's literally, usually there's 50,000 cases in backlog with the embassy system. Right now, there's, last I checked, maybe a week or two ago, there was like 500,000. So there's 10 times as many cases in backlog right now. And so, you know, you got to keep that in mind. How are we going to answer something uh, a year in the future now when it went from 50,000 to 500,000? Uh, and it's not really getting better. So th these are the problems that we have in the immigration system. And that that just have to deal with. Uh, but thank you for your question. In general, the immigration system right now is at a you know at, at a major issue. I mean, if you see what's happening with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, how messy that is. Uh, these are the people um, that have uh, that are running the game of the system. There's so many people in Afghanistan who have been waiting for the embassy visa interview for over a year, and all of a sudden they're stuck and uh, going undergoing you know horrible humanitarian situation when they could have had their visas issued um, or potentially gotten some sort of humanitarian parole automatically to be able to come to the United States, but they didn't. So seeing how bad the poor Af Afghanistani people, um, they say, don't say Afghani, it's, it's Afghan. Um, you know, I, I, Farsi, I speak Farsi, we could say Afghani. So I, I'm not sure why there's that big a deal difference with what they're making right now. But um, if it's in English, Afghan, Afghan people, uh, if they treated them like that after all the hell they've been for the last 20, 40, 50 years, um, you know, if you're from some other country, you know, just, I, I, I don't see them treating you any better, but you know, we could, we could always hope for the best. That's all we can do. We have a question. Remy Lee asks, uh, if I stayed outside the U S for two years as a resident, am I still eligible for four year one day rule? Well, first of all, you've been outside for two years as a resident. Uh, you may have been considered to have abandoned your status. So that's a major issue. We got to see whether you even can keep your green card. Have you been filing taxes? Have you been filing taxes as a resident? Um, and so there's all these issues. The four-year and one-day rule doesn't really exist anymore. It's a four-year, six-month, and one-day rule. I've done a, a detailed video on this. You can check it out in JQK Clips. And I talk about that. And this is for citizenship, the question they're asking for. Um, when you're outside for more than a year, there's a thing called the four-year, one-day rule. Um, but essentially, that doesn't exist. I don't want you to reset, do a full five years after entry um, before filing case. That's the way I would do it. Um, but, uh, you know, that two year absence, we have a good reason for that. If the discussion comes up, 
but I don't rely on these four year one day rules. I would go with the four full five years. And you know, it's the end of the show. We're just gonna announce our last raffle winner, Remily. The question we're answering right now. Um, just take a screenshot of where you're watching this live so I can see your screen name is you and email it to me at info at jqklaw.com, info at jqklaw.com. And I'll reply with the link so you can schedule a free 15-minute video consultation so we can talk more discreetly and private about your case in a short time to see uh, what's going on and give you some guidance there. But thank you for your question. I think we'll take just one more question. You know, I'm looking at my phone right now and I'm looking at my computer. Uh, I think my laptop's uh, timer's off. My phone is saying 615. So apparently we started 15 minutes early. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm on vacation and, and things just got messy. So we'll stay on a little bit longer to kind of mix it up right. <laughs> so we have a question from Facebook user. It says, is the COVID-19 vaccine compulsory for form I-751 petition removal as residents? So when a person gets their green card based on marriage, and at the time the green card is delivered, the marriage is less than two years old, they get a conditional green card that the file for removal of conditions, get a full 10-year green card around two years later. Uh, these new requirement for people getting a green card, the requirement that the COVID vaccine be done and have proof of it, um, for the most part, there are exceptions, that goes into effect on October 1st, does not apply for removal of conditions. These are people who are going to get their green card, not who actually have the green card. And a conditional green card is a green card, so it's not a requirement that you get it for immigration purposes. Thank you for your question. Next question is from Mike. Mike asks, uh, did I did I did file I six one A? Can I file I six zero one before going to consular interview? I do not want to be stuck abroad. So no, if you file the six one A waiver, um, you file that before you leave, and then you leave for your interview. Um, that's it, because you can only file the six zero one if doing consular processing after you get denied at the interview. So if you go do the I six one A, it's approved. You go to the interview, and for some reason they deny you and they don't accept the I-601A waiver, that is a time that you have permission to file a 601 and you're stuck outside for over a year, two years probably. It's a horrible disaster. That's why we had to try to find the best way and the alternatives to not leave. Maybe you have, you know, DACA and you can press advanced parole. Uh, maybe you, you're subject to a thing called 245I, which is an exception. Maybe this, maybe that. It's good to talk with an immigration attorney and private to see if any of these exceptions exist to prevent you from having to leave and go outside the United States. Um, because uh, leaving is a major disaster. All right, I think we'll take one more question. Sorry, my time's got mixed up because my laptop's giving me a wrong time. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, but we'll take one last question if there are any. If not, I also want to thank everybody who joined in. Um, Y'all were really kind and good questions. We have three free consultations coming for Saad, Remily, and for uh, Alassan. I uh, appreciate your questions. I'm immigration lawyer John Tesravi. I'll be back again in the office next wednesday 6 p.m pacific i'll start at the right time and take your general educational based immigration questions there uh, if you are interested in doing a fiance or marriage green card case just download the ultimate marriage green card guide at marriageimmigrationlaw.com and so you could really get to know uh what's going on with the immigration system we got some kind words much else says hello jordan says love you remley says thank you god bless you all wish you all the best and hopefully the immigration system will treat you too bad and you'll get done with it as soon as possible. I know it's a stressful process and I just see it as my goal to try to alleviate somewhat the stress and pain of people going through it. God bless everyone. Be safe. Have a good one. Bye-bye.